Good morning, ninjas. How is everybody today? Hope everyone out there is doing great. Um, the other day we released all the new talks for week three. We've got some awesome choral stuff and a lot of cool things coming up. We've got a couple more we're gonna be adding in uh, later today and tomorrow. So make sure to check it out on the website and follow us on social media for the latest updates. I've just also launched today's poll and everything like that to help us pick the topics for the next uh, talks. Um, today we've got a really special talk, something really different. Um, we've got Grace Carr joining us all the way from Northern Ireland. She's a marine biologist and scuba instructor working out there right now. Um, so hello, Grace. Good morning. How are you? Good. Awesome. So let me uh, stop sharing my screen and I hand it over to you. No problem. Okay, there you go. Okay, so hello, my name is Grace Carr, and today I'm going to be talking to you a wee bit about the sharks, skates, and rays that are found in Irish waters. So first, I'm just going to tell you a wee bit about myself. Um, so I am a dive instructor, have been for a few years, and um, I've worked in many places around the world. So I've worked in Indonesia. And while I was there, I also volunteered for a charity over there called Aquatic Alliance, which was trying to get manta rays protected in Indonesian waters by proving that they're a migratory species. So that was really cool. I've also worked in Mexico as well, in Playa del Carmen, um, where we took a lot of people diving with bull sharks. And so it was great to hear Friday Lara's talk on Monday about the bull sharks of uh, Cabo Pulmo. Uh, I've also just recently graduated um, with a degree in marine biology from Queen's University in Belfast. And while I was doing my degree, I also interned at the Hawaiian Institute of Marine Biology. And while over there, I got a lot of experience uh, working with scalloped hammerheads and tigers um, and experience in tagging the sharks um, for research over there as well. So in my spare time, I like to go around schools and give talks about shark and ocean conservation. I also go to um, festivals or workplaces, aquariums, different places like that, anywhere to sort of give a talk um, if they're interested in learning more about uh, sharks of Ireland and sharks around the world as well. So it's always really great to see how enthusiastic kids are about the ocean and about sharks. Um, and I'm always quite surprised um, at how many adults don't actually realise how many sharks we have in Irish waters. A lot of people seem to think that sharks are in tropical warm waters and that we don't actually get them too much over here, uh, but that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, and Ireland is a small island. I know so many amazing watermen and water women. Um, we have the Atlantic on the west coast, so we've got amazing surf, um, there's lots of free diving, lots of ocean swims. So the ocean is a massive part for um, a lot of people that live in Ireland, it's a massive part of their lives. So it's surprising when people don't actually realize what is in the ocean as well. So we actually have around 71 species of shark skates and rays in Irish waters. So 58 of these have been assessed, which means there's been research done on them uh, to be given into the IUCN so that they can be judged whether they're critically endangered or vulnerable. And unfortunately, about 10.3% of the species that are found in our waters are critically endangered which is not where you want an animal to be. You really want them to be sitting at least concerned. So it's a worry whenever so many people don't realize we have these animals in our waters, then they definitely don't realize that they are critically endangered and that they definitely do need our protection as well. So there's a little quote that I think is really appropriate uh, from Baba Diem. So it is, in the end, we will protect only what we love. We will love only what we understand and we will understand only what we are taught. So I think it's really important um, that people learn about the animals that are in our waters um, so that they can understand them, grow to love them. And whenever you love something, you want to protect it um, and you want to learn about the different ways that you can do this. So now I'll get on to some of the species that we see here. So the first one I'm going to talk to you a little bit about is the Baskin shark. So this species is the second largest uh, fish in the ocean, just after the whale shark. So they can range from about six meters to 11 meters long. 
really, really, really big animals, and they are filter feeders as well. So you can see in this image here, uh, the Basin shark has his mouth open, and you see the black lines that are inside his mouth. Uh, they're called gill rakers. So what the Basin shark does is just open his mouth and swim through the water and filter out all the plankton, which it's its food source. So Irish waters are super productive because we've got this cold northern current coming down from the Arctic. And then we also have the Gulf Stream, uh, the warm Gulf Stream coming across the Atlantic. So these two different temperatures of water are meeting um, off of the Irish coast. We also have massive areas of upwelling. So that's whenever um, water from really deep that's full of nutrients is coming up to the surface. So that makes our waters really productive, full of plankton. Plankton brings in big um, shows of fish. We're saying bring in bigger animals as well. So that's why we get so many migrated species coming through these waters too. So Basin sharks give birth to live young as well. They've got one of the longest pregnancies of any vertebrae. So their pregnancy can last nearly three and a half years. They only give birth to a few pups at a time as well. These pups are quite large um, as well. So they don't give birth um, in great numbers. And unfortunately in Irish waters, Basin sharks are listed as endangered, but there's a lot of research going on for Basin sharks at the moment. Um, in America and in Ireland because they migrate such vast distances. So basking sharks that have been tagged off the coast of Ireland have actually been found over in Canada and have also been found down in South Africa as well. So they move massive distances and there's still a lot of research going on to find out what they are doing when they're doing this. And the best times to see basking sharks around Ireland is around May to September time. So hopefully this year as well, we'll get a good few around our coast. Now I have a little video here just showing a Baskin shark feeding as well. So you'll see them coming through the water now. You can see his gill rakers there with his mouth open. So the second species I'm gonna talk about is the poor beagle shark. So these sharks um, actually get confused for great whites a lot in our waters and you can see the similarities there. So poor beagles and great white sharks and bass and sharks are all, are all within the same order um, of lamniforms. So they are cousins and they do kind of look um, alike. So poor beagles can get up to about three and a half meters long. Uh, they also give birth to live young and they can live to over 50 years of age as well. They also do travel big distances too. So poor beagles tags in Irish waters have also been seen in Newfoundland as well. And it's uh, quite easy to identify a poor beagle as well because behind its dorsal fin, which is the fin on the top of the shark, there is a white area, so like a white spot behind the fin. And that's why you can tell uh, that it's a poor beagle shark. And the best times to sort of see them in Irish waters is between June and October as well. Now this is the spur dog shark. So this one isn't as big as the other ones, maybe about 92 centimeters long, so under a meter. These are one of my favorite wee sharks. So they get their name because they've got a poisonous spine um, in front and behind their dorsal fin, and this can be used to protect them against predators. They can live to over 70 years old as well. So they don't sexually mature um, for quite a long time as well and they only have a litter of pups every two years. So their pregnancies normally last about um, 18 to 22 months and they travel in large groups as well. So if one gets caught, uh, unfortunately, a lot of them could actually get caught and get taken out of the water in one go. So that's why they are endangered and they do need to have uh, marine protected areas uh, to prevent their numbers from going down even further. Another shark found in our water is the blue shark. So these are really easy to identify because of the wonderful metallic blue color that they are. It's thought that they travel uh, clockwise from the Caribbean over to Irish waters and then clockwise again back to the Caribbean. Um, I've just seen that my laptop, the battery is a bit low, so I'm just gonna move it over here so I can plug it in.
sorry about that. I didn't want the battery to die on me. So, blue shark, yes, so they travel um, clockwise around the Atlantic. So they come over on the Gulf Stream to us and then they spend the summer months uh, around Irish waters. And then they travel back to the Caribbean again on the North Equatorial Current. So these sharks also give birth to live young. They have about 35 pups in a litter. They're normally a pelagic species, but uh, you can swim with them in the summertime off the northwest coast of Ireland at a place called Donegal. Now, another shark in our waters that gets uh, confused for a great white is the choke shark. So you can probably see the resemblance of the great white when you look at the choke shark because it's got the gray coloring on the top and then the white coloring underneath just like a great white shark. But these sharks are a lot smaller, so they don't even reach two meters. Um, they also travel quite far as well. So ones that are tagged here have been spotted in the Canary Islands. There's been a few places um, in Ireland where they are nursery areas uh, along the east coast of Ireland. So Strangford Lock and Carlingford Lock, for anyone from Ireland that's listening in, they'll know these areas, um, were thought to be pupping grounds and nursery grounds for juveniles. But unfortunately, due to uh, commercial fishing, their numbers have declined a bit as well. And thresh shark. So thresh sharks are found all over the world. Uh, know that they're found in the water as well. Not very. Right. If you're lucky, you could them. Like this photo here of a thresher breaching was taken off the west coast of Ireland as well. So the one of the main features of a thresher shark is its long upper caudal tail, which you can see there clearly in the photo. So it uses this tail to whip through the water and it can stun fish whenever it whips through the water and then the fish is stunned and then it's easier for the thresher to uh, catch the fish then. So the summer months is whenever you're more likely to see them in our waters. And these guys as well also give birth to live young. So that's just a few of the sharks that are found here. And I'm going to talk a wee bit more about some skates and rays as well. So between skates and rays. So they look quite similar, but there's a few major differences with them. So on the left, we have skates and on the right, we have a ray. So rays have a long, thin tail, while skates have got a shorter, thicker tail. Rays also have a stinger, sometimes have a stinger on their tail, not always, but skates don't have a stinger on their tail, but they do have a small dorsal fin, just like a shark. Uh, you can also see that the skate has got a longer nose kind of point, and the snout of the ray is a bit more rounded. So the major difference between skates and rays is that skates uh, lay eggs, while rays give birth to live young. So these are some of the egg cases which are seen. So most of these are skate egg cases, but the two small ones at the end are shark egg cases. So some sharks do lay eggs as well. They don't all give birth to live young. So this is a diagram of a skate egg. So the main body of the egg is called a capsule. And then it's got little pointy bits at each corner and these are called the horns. So sometimes these are attached, sometimes they're broken off. Uh, skate eggs and shark eggs are made of keratin. So they are durable. And whenever they are washed up on shore, they actually do look like seaweed a lot. So sometimes it just gets mistaken for seaweed. Uh, you've probably seen eggs on the beach or you might not have known what to look for and walk straight over them thinking that it was seaweed. So the small spotted cat shark is one of the sharks that lay eggs. So the difference with the shark eggs is that they don't have the pointy horns at the corners. They actually have little curly tendrils. So it's been, small spotted cat sharks have been seen uh, laying eggs and taking a really long time placing their eggs. And they use these little curly tendrils to attach them to stuff on the bottom. So like seaweed or rocks or something to make sure that the eggs are uh, super. Because once they lay the eggs, uh, they take about five to six months to actually hatch. So they have to be really sure that their eggs are nice and safe whenever they're, they're laying them. This is the most, one of the most common ones in Ireland as well. So these are the egg cases that we do find the most of. 
and there's a little picture of a small spotted cat shark, really small, less than a meter in length as well. And this is just a short video uh, showing the cases. And inside you can see the baby, you can see the mouth moving and the little gills moving as well. So the next one I'm going to talk about is the thornback ray. So like I said earlier, rays give birth to live young and skits lay eggs. And this is true. So the thornback ray is actually a skit, not a ray, but that's just what it's been called. So that's why I've also put in the scientific name Rajik Sabata there, just underneath it. So thornback rays get their names because they've got little spikes on their back, which they can use to protect themselves. Uh, they can live for more than 15 years. They don't sexually mature for a long time as well, uh, so they can't start reproducing um, until they're about six to eight. Uh, they lay about 160 eggs um, each year as well. And you can see the sort of size of the egg case there compared to your hand. And that's what a thornback ray or skit looks like. You can tell by the photo that it is a skit because the snout is longer. It doesn't have the blunt snout of a, of a ray. Another shark egg now, as you can tell because of the curly tendrils at each end as well. So the bull husk or the nurse hound shark lays this egg. So it's a bit bigger than the small spotted cat shark. The egg case is a bit bigger as well. It also has thick grooves uh, down each side and they take about six to 11 months to hatch. So again, really important for the mum to place the eggs really carefully and make sure the curly tendrils are wrapped around something secure. And this here is a bull huss. So bull husses and small spotted cat sharks are actually sold as um, meat in fish and chish, chip shops around Ireland. They won't actually be called small spotted cat shark or bull huss. They'll generally go by names like rock salmon or rock eel um, or flake. So it's always important if you're getting um, fish to ask what the fish is and check the name just to make sure that you're not eating any of our local sharks. Now the undulate ray is quite easy to identify as well. Uh, so again, it says ray, but it is a skit. It has the little horns on each end, but it also has lots of extra filaments hanging off it. Uh, these ones are generally found along the south of Ireland, so they prefer the warmer waters, but any of the egg cases that we have found so far are all along the south coast of Ireland. They're quite large as well, egg cases. Um, about seven to eight centimeters, and the undulate ray gets its name because of how it moves through the water. I have a video here. So this video was taken um, in Irish waters. And you can see on the tail as well, that it has the dorsal fins. So rays do not have dorsal fins on their tails, but skits do. But yeah, really beautiful how they move through the water. Now, so this is the common or flapper skit. Uh, so you can see the size of the egg case there. It is really, really, really big. So only one of these have been found um, off the west coast of Ireland in a place called Sligo. The egg cases, uh, the horns are usually broken off. So it's just the capsule that um, is found. Uh, so it kind of just looks like that. So quite hard to find as well. Um, so it's called a common flapper skate, but unfortunately it's actually not very common at all. It is critically endangered. Uh, so finding an egg case of the common flapper skate is amazing and should definitely be, you should let scientists know about it. So there is a conservation organization that I work with uh, in Northern Ireland called Sea Deep and it's part of the NGO Ulster Wildlife. And what they do is they do egg case surveys, but they also do training sessions for tagging shark skates and rays in our waters to try and get uh, as much data as possible to try and get more leverage to push governments to get better legislation for protection uh, and more MPAs so that our shark skates and rays have a chance to replenish their numbers. So whenever tagging an animal, um, you have to be really, really careful. 
So show this here is an image of a skate skeleton. So you can see how delicate the skeleton is. The shark skates and red skeletons aren't actually made of bone either, they're made of cartilage. So if you feel the little rubbery bits at the end of your nose or the top of your ear, that's actually what shark skeletons are made out of. So really lightweight, uh, helps them move really fast in the water, uh, but also uh, means you have to be super careful whenever you are handling them as well. And you might notice something really important missing uh, from the skeleton there. Uh, shark skates and reds don't actually have a rib cage, so it's the pressure from the ocean that's protecting all their internal organs. So whenever the animals are actually taken out of the water, uh, you have to hold them and protect their organs, otherwise they can uh, get really, really hurt. So that, there's a wee image sort of showing good handling techniques uh, for these animals. And have an image here. So the top image there is one of the was the first common flatfish gate that was tagged by water. So it's being supported by the bottom of the boat to make sure that its organs are kept nice and safe. And then also there's a photo of it in the water too. Have a little video here. So this is of a female uh, resting on the bottom. This is taken in Scotland. Uh, and then about 30 seconds in, a male flatfish gate swims over the top of her as well. So it's the largest gate in the, in the world as well. You can't actually tell uh, too much by the photos there, but it does reach three meters from wingtip to wing, wingtip. So an amazing animal, and we definitely want to try and get as much protection for it as we possibly can. And here's the male flatbush gate moving over the top of her there as well. So there's lots of research going on with universities in Ireland at the moment to see whether it'd be possible to rewild the animals. Uh, we used to have massive amounts of them in the 60s and there's actually tourism leaflets um, about Ireland in the 60s uh, saying that we have massive amounts of these numbers and encouraging sport fishing and unfortunately uh, that's one of the reasons why their numbers got so depleted as well. So this is Sea Deep, uh, which is the conservation organization that is trying to get protection for these animals through tagging and also through um, egg case surveys as well. So you can go onto the website www.cdeepni.org. I only talked about uh, a couple of the egg cases there because we don't have time to go through all of them, but there's so many uh, and these are all found um, on Irish coasts and UK coasts as well. So you can go out uh, by yourself looking for the egg cases and it's kind of like a citizen science uh, thing where you just go out and if you find an egg case, take a photo of it, you upload it to the website. The marine, if you can identify it, the marine biologists uh, working there will be able to identify it and all this data is getting collected. If there's an area that has quite a large number of um, egg cases, then we'll send out divers to do a more thorough search in the water because um, it could be a possible um, pupping ground or nursery ground and if it is then it's super important that we try to get that area protected and uh, have no fishing zones um, in it so that the juveniles have a chance to grow these wonderful animals. So that's everything with me today so thanks for listening and if you have any questions I'll do my best to try and answer them. Awesome. Thank you so much, Grace. It's amazing. I find it so incredible how, I mean, we never really think of like these cold waters to have such a big amount of life and everything. And um, when I used to dive in the UK, I always get asked, well, what do you see there? Is there animals? I'm like, well, of course, it's the ocean. Like, it's, in, it's incredible, though, like how much you have in Ireland. It's just beautiful, beautiful how many sharks and rays are there. So guys, let's start off with some questions. If you click the Q&A box in the bottom of your screen or top of your screen, um, you can type in your questions and we'll read them out to Grace and uh, start going from there. So let me get this open. All right. So uh, Haley asks, how common would it be to come along an egg case while you were just walking across the beach? Oh, really common. Like they are everywhere. Um, I was surprised as well. Um, because I remember like seeing them years and years ago, but not actually realizing what they were because they look so similar to seaweed. Um, especially whenever they're wet, they have the same sort of texture as well, but uh, literally on nearly every 
coastline um, on any sort of short, short walk you're bound to find an egg case. Awesome. Thank you. So Sue from London says, she says, hi from London. Are the shark skates and rays in Ireland different from those found um, in the waters around mainland UK and Europe? Uh, some of them. So say like the spur dog and the small spotted cat shark and like the thornback rays and stuff, they'll be found all along uh, mainland UK. Some of the animals um, are more sort of pelagic species. So that's why we would have them more off the west coast of Ireland. So you mightn't actually find them, you know, like off like the east coast of England and stuff because the waters wouldn't be deep enough. Uh, but no, we do share a lot of the, of the same species because the water is uh, like similar temperature and stuff. Awesome, thank you. So uh, Sabiel writes, hi Grace, I'm just down in Galway and wondering if you guys would need any volunteers at Sea Deep over the summer, if and when things go back to normal. Yeah, no, that would be brilliant. Um, yeah, so whenever things get back to normal, we did have lots of um, tagging uh, days organized and also uh, days where we go out with people um, for egg case hunts just to get people started, you know, get them used to like where to look and stuff like that. So hopefully whenever this all um, is calming down a bit and we're all allowed outside again, then these things will be up and running. But we will be um, posting about it on the website and then also on Instagram as well. So yeah, we're always, um, any volunteers at all is um, much appreciated. Oh, that's awesome. I'd love to come over and volunteer with you guys. have to get the dry suit out again now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Christina asks, what is the difference between uh, a whale shark and the first shark you spoke of, the basking shark? The basking shark. So whale sharks are bigger than basking sharks. Uh, so the basking shark is the second largest fish in the sea. Uh, they are quite similar, like with um, the fact that they're both filter feeders. So they both swim through the water with their mouths open, filtering the plankton out. Uh, they both give birth to live young. Um, but basking sharks um, have a much longer pregnancy. They only give birth to a couple of pups at a time, while whale sharks actually give birth to quite a lot. Um, and whale sharks wouldn't be found in temperate waters at all. They're in tropical waters, uh, while basking sharks um, can be in the cold waters around us. Awesome, thank you so much for that. So Teresa asks, how possible is it to see basking sharks while diving? And then are there specific times of the year for them? Yeah, so the best time to see them around Ireland is May to October time. Uh, so we were actually meant to go out tagging in May off the west coast of Ireland. I unfortunately don't think that that's going to be happening now, uh, but that's the best time to sort of see them. Um, there is a lot. There is protection for basking sharks, so you're not um, to tag them and stuff. You have to have the proper permits um, from the environmental organisations around here. Uh, if you're diving with them, you do have to try and stay about four metres away from them, and um, because of their protection. But you know, sometimes they will come right up to you. Uh, but they are endangered, so you you're not guaranteed to see them. Um, you'd be very very lucky to see them. Awesome. I would love to see one. We tried when I used to live in the UK, we tried going down to Weymouth a few times to see them when they come in that area and it was, never had the good luck. <laughs> no, oh, they're class. I love their wee faces. Oh yeah, their faces are incredible. It's so beautiful. <laughs> awesome. So Steph uh, asks, this is awesome. Thank you. I've only dived in 17 degrees Celsius plus waters, but I've been flirting with braving the dry suit. And thanks to your presentation, I'm buzzing to dive in Ireland. Are the best sites off Ireland or Northern Ireland? Um, so both really. So Donegal is, um, it's in the north of Ireland um, and it's got some brilliant dive sites. So that's a good place to see blue sharks, to see uh, basking sharks. So yeah, no, there's good sites in Northern Ireland and down the south of Ireland as well. Uh, I would say the better sites are sort of where the Atlantic Sea is more so than the Irish Sea. But uh, yeah, that's class, definitely. Get your dry suit on and come over diving. Sounds wonderful. A little cold, but still wonderful. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you get used to it. <laughs> yeah. What's your normal temperatures up there? Um, I suppose it's, it depends on the time of year. I haven't dove over winter this year. Um, yeah, cold, very cold. <laughs> 
<laughs> Very cold. <laughs> it's good to get your dry suit qualification. I have some people that go out diving in wetsuits and they definitely um, feel it. <laughs> Regret that. <Yeah. laughs> and then they immediately go to the shop and get their dry suit certification right after. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Sorsha asks, is it all year round you would likely to find egg cases on the beach or is it only in certain months? Uh, no, all year round you can see them. Um, so the egg, like different species lay eggs at different times um, or some of them can lay eggs all year round, but you can find the egg cases all year round. Uh, sometimes after a big storm, uh, lots of them will get washed on the shore and uh, that's a good time to sort of find them as well. Awesome. And Sue asks, uh, you mentioned rewilding flapper skates. How is this done? So this is only this is only at the very, very start of this project. Um, so there used to be a lot of flapper skates in a place called Strangford Lock in Ireland. Um, and unfortunately, they were overfished. Um, so it's going to be a, a, a massive long project to actually rewild them. You would have to make sure that there is um, species there for the flapper skates to prey on. Um, and obviously there's no guarantee uh, that rewilding would be effective, but uh, there's lots of research going on at the minute to try and see if this would be possible because introducing, um, you know, predators back into an ecosystem can have lots of different effects. So uh, they need to take all of that into account before it will actually get done. But hopefully we have got some flapper skates um, still around and stuff. So. Hopefully we'll get the numbers back up. That's incredible. It's a very interesting project. Really, really incredible. Um, Linda asks, hi, Grace. Where do you dive on the north coast? Which are the most common sharks and rays around Port Rush and Port Stewart, northwest coast of Ireland? So there will be lots of um, small spotted cat sharks, lots of bull husks. Um, if you're diving off the northwest coast, um, during the summertime, that's brilliant to see basking sharks there and also blue sharks. So I'm hoping to get out and swim with some blue sharks this summer um, out of Donegal Bay. Uh, so Donegal Bay is maybe about an hour and a half away from Port Rush. Um, so yeah, so if you're in that area, there's loads of really good, good dive spots. Oh, it's incredible. So Charlie asks, sorry, says, thanks so much for this talk, Grace. Fascinating stuff. Is there any work going on to prove whether those locations in Ireland are definitely nursery grounds for taupe? And if so, what challenges have been faced in researching those areas and is work ongoing to have these areas protected? So, sorry, I'm just rereading it here. Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah, so the locations that were taupe nurseries was Carlingford Lock and um, Strangford Lock as well. So Carlingford Lock, uh, there was lots of juveniles found and also lots of pregnant uh, females. So that was why it was suggested that this was a nursery ground uh, for taupe. So unfortunately there is a lot of uh, dredging because there's Carlingford Lock oysters, uh, which are quite popular. So there's a lot of dredging and stuff that goes on there. So this has possibly had an effect um, on the nursery ground. And the areas are protected, but they're not protected enough. Like for, this is what Sea Deep's trying to do. While there'll be lots of areas of uh, special protection around Ireland, there isn't actually a lot of areas where there's like no fishing allowed. Um, so that's why we want to try and get more research uh, to be able to push governments to be like, no, we need this area completely, no take, no nothing going on so that the animals have got a chance to um, get their numbers back up. Awesome. So Travis says, very interesting presentation. Thank you. Um, and then Anonymous writes, are there any predatory sharks in Irish waters or are they predominantly filter feeders? P.S. You're great. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so um, a lot of them are predatory sharks. Uh, so the largest one, Baskin shark, is a filter feeder. Um, but even like the smaller sharks um like the spur dog and stuff they'll uh, predate on crabs and um, different crustaceans mollusks and um, small fish uh, so i think most of sort of the sharks and rays would be predatory um while a few are just sort of fil filter feeders okay awesome 
And Travis asks, regarding populations, do you know of methods for individual identification? Um, so with basking sharks, they have got um, unique patterns on their backs as well. Um, so that can um, help identify them. And then also with any sort of species of sharks, um, they might have little notches in their fins, on their tails. Uh, so getting photo IDs of animals is always really good uh, because then you can see if they're migratory or not. Um, that was one of the things that we were actually doing in, in Indonesia as well, was taking photos of the uh, spot patterns of manta rays to prove that this manta ray was spotted here and then also spotted somewhere else to show that they're migratory. Um, so that's a good way for basking sharks as well. Um, so that's how you would be able to identify individuals that way. Otherwise as well, like with the tagging programs as well, uh, the little tags would have a individual number on them. So that's how we know that some basking sharks and some poor beagles that were tagged in Ireland have actually been seen um, across the Atlantic or down in the Canary Islands. Oh, incredible. Stephanie says, hi from Geneva. Thank you for your presentation. How many sharks, rays and skates are tagged from sea deep right now? Um, I don't know the exact number. I could definitely find out for you. Um, we would be in like the hundreds anyway, but I don't know um, the exact number, but I will definitely find out and can email Jay or email you and, and let you know. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, Stephanie, feel free to, uh, you can either um, message one of us on social media, on Instagram or anything like that, and we can get you the answer back and anything like that. Perfect. So Faye asks, how likely do you think it is there are great whites in UK waters? And please say very likely because I would love to see one. <laughs> <laughs> so would I. Um, <laughs> so I don't, I don't think that it's very likely. No. Um, there's um, a lot of uh, misidentification. So like Baskin sharks, uh, because they're so big as well, there's like this dark shadow uh, that you can see under the water and lots of people um, have thought that they're uh, great whites. Uh, the same with the poor beagle, uh, really similar sort of face to a great white. And also um, the taupe because it's gray on top and then has the underbelly. Uh, so there's lots of sharks that look very, very similar to great whites. So I think that's where the sort of misidentification has, has come. But no, we might have to go a wee bit further afield to see some great whites. I have to come down to Mexico then. <laughs> yeah. So Teresa asks, do you have an idea where basking sharks are giving birth? No, I wish. <laughs> I, know that I actually, um, from my dissertation uh, in university, uh, was on the migratory uh, roots of basking sharks. And then I had to change it, but I, it started off with the migratory roots of basking sharks. And that was one of the big questions, like, where are they going? Where are they giving birth? Um, so no, don't have any idea yet, but there's people out there that are going to find this out. So hopefully soon. I, I find that personally so amazing that with some of the largest animals in the ocean, we know so little about them and they're so huge. Yeah. yeah. You know, we would think that we would be able to find where they go or what they're doing or something. I, mean, with I know, it's like, where are they going? It's incredible. Amazing. <laughs> so Haley asked, Grace, you also mentioned that bullhusks were sold as rock salmon. Do you think the change in name affects the perception consumers have purchasing these skates as they may think it is just salmon? Additionally, does this increase its chance of overfishing? Yeah, so I think, um, so shark meat isn't just sold in Ireland, it is sold all over the world and it always does seem to, um, a lot of times it's not actually labeled as the species that it is. Um, especially like large predatory sharks um, that would have high levels of mercury in their meat um, would always seem to be labeled as something else. Um, over here, um, getting called rock salmon, um, flakes, stuff like that. Um, people just assume it's a fish or a type of salmon or something. They would never think that it's a shark that they're eating because they think that would actually put off um, a lot of people from eating them. Um, and yeah, no, they do uh, get overfished and um, they also get caught as bycatch as well. Um, so 
fishing boats might be out going to catch something else, but then unfortunately grow, get lots of uh, non-target species as well. So that takes a lot of their numbers out too. And then they'll um, try and sell these species then when they get back on land to get some money for them. Um, and so they're sold as meat then. Yeah, and I think that's a, a huge issue, not just say in Ireland, but all over the world right now um, with the mislabeling and misnaming or changing the names to different things so that they're more sellable in a way to the consumer's eyes. Um, there's been a, quite a few research projects that have been coming out in this last year. Um, the one ones by Nakawe Project, for instance, and looking at DNA testing of different uh, fish within, whether it be in markets, restaurants, et cetera, around the world. And the results are, are very alarming. And you start to see, you know, species that are, you know, critically endangered or near threatened or endangered, and they're coming up on menus and being mislabeled as something else and all that. It's really uh, heartbreaking in a sense. And um shows that we really need more regulation into that in that part of the industry yeah definitely it's scary so steph asks how did you find getting to this point in your career it feels like it's more difficult establishing yourself as a marine biologist or scientist from say europe than more tourist popular diving destinations like australasia or mexico etc um, I don't think so. Like, um, like I was saying um, earlier about uh, the different currents that are coming over towards Ireland. So we have the North Atlantic, or sorry, the North Current coming down, and then we also have the Gulf Stream coming over. And uh, our water are so productive. Um, like we get huge uh, marine megafauna coming through, like humpback whales. We also get um, mola mola, the oceanic sunfish coming because. Um, the oceans are so productive. Um, so I know that there is actually scientists coming over from Hawaii. Uh, oh, they were meant to be coming over this summer um, to do work on like six gill sharks um, and stuff like that. So I, I think people um, don't realize uh, how uh, rich our marine life is around here. Uh, so there is actually a lot of jobs and opportunities and research uh, opportunities coming up around um, Ireland, which is very, very exciting especially with sharks too. So it's a good time to, to want to research sharks around here. Um, I think the best uh, thing to do is having, having a marine biology degree um, is obviously super important, but then also doing loads of volunteering. So I have volunteered with um, loads of charities since I was younger uh, because it all just sort of goes onto your CV and the more sort of uh, volunteering you have, um, the more experience it is and then just the better it, it looks for, to, to try and get a job then as well so that's what i would always say to people um that want to do marine biology is just always try and get as much interning as you can as much volunteering doesn't matter if you're obviously it's always nice to get paid but um trying to just get as much experience as possible is really important okay thank you for that and the last question we have is Linda asks, Grace, I've done a project with some teenagers using drones to take footage and possible dorsal fin mucus samples from basking sharks to gather data. What are your feelings on this type of data gathering for endangered sharks, etc.? I think that like the the least sort of um because we want to we want to leave the animals alone, like especially even with tagging and stuff, the best way to, to tag an animal is keeping it in the water and trying to tag it. Uh, the more you mess, the stressed out they can be um, and stuff. So the the least amount of uh, interfering with them, um, the better. So it sounds pretty good, like using drones to take footage is brilliant um, because the sharks wouldn't notice um, at all. And because they are such big animals, like whenever, um, they've been being tagged around here. So they just swim past the boat and it is just sort of like, there isn't a diver in the water with them or anything. You tag them from the boat. Uh, obviously they're far too big to take out of the water as well. Um, so yeah, I imagine it would be super, um, super easy to get a, a mucus sample from the fin because all you'd have to do is just let it sort of brush past you. Um, so yeah, I think that that's a really uh, responsible way for data gathering for endangered sharks, definitely. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for stopping by today. Thank you for teaching us all about the sharks and rays and skates of Ireland. Um, guys, thank you for tuning in and everything like that. Tomorrow we're back at 10 a.m. Uh, with Reggie Domingo from the Cowway Project talking about uh, nature as a sustainable resource and looking at how ecotourism can 
um, help protect areas and everything like that. Make sure to follow us on uh, Instagram and social media at, uh, at Dive Ninjas. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Grace, thank you so much again. Thanks for coming all the way here from Ireland. And uh, we'll see you soon. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you. Have a good Bye. day, guys. Take care. Well, um, oh, my.